Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on from Lupus Europe on what we learned from the European Lupus Meeting 2022. My name is Jeanette Anderson, and I'm the chair of Lupus Europe. But today I'm here because I'm also the leader of Lupus Europe's patient advisory network, also called PAN. We are also streaming live on Facebook. So hello to everyone out there. And you will be able to also get your questions answered later on. Next slide, please. So at the European Lupus Meeting, it took place at Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden, from October 5 to 8. It had 850 attendees from 54 countries. Of those, 18 were PAN members from Lupus Europe. It was the first time with patients included in the scientific program. Patients were a part of the organizing committee. And we had a dedicated program session for HCPs and patients. These are indeed very exciting times for lupus. There's a general feeling of optimism, uh, but don't take my word for it. Next slide, please, Alan. These are some of the PAN members who were taking part. They all decided beforehand which sessions they would like to participate in. And if they heard something interesting for patients, they asked the speaker for a short recap of their presentation afterwards and recorded it. So all the patients who weren't attending could still get the information. They did an amazing job and represented the lupus community in a great way that was really noticed among researchers, doctors, pharmaceutical industry, and so on. So for that, we want to give a huge thank you. Now, here are some of the, the videos that re they recorded and some of their own personal testimonials. Enjoy. You should see it. We do. The first thing that I really appreciate about this meeting is that uh, it's full yeah. of doctors you get a sound? One, uh, willing to do something. Yes. yes. To us. So it's, it's in any case, it's nice to see that uh, there are a lot of people helping us uh, in general. Mm -hmm. What really you understand when you're here is that and each of us is completely different from the other. So it's, uh, and, and that's what, what you always, when you're here, you, you understand. You understand that you are part of uh, a, a group, a part of uh, a big group that is working all together with the same objective. So I think we are doing a very good job uh, in, uh, in announcing uh, the contribution that we as a volunteer, patient volunteer, I don't know how we can we call, uh, we can do in uh, not only research, also in enhancing the quality of life and doing uh, in letting the doctors better understand which is uh, the point of view of patient. Uh, there are so yeah, really so many things that we can do. One of the most interesting aspects of lupus is the fact that the disease starts with what we call a preclinical phase. That is uh, a period of, of several years where you have some things in the blood, uh, either interferon or antibodies, which suggest that uh, later you may be developing lupus. And uh, this is followed several years uh, later in a small number of patients with uh, clinically active lupus. Uh, what I discussed in this conference was what we have learned uh, about this uh, thing and uh, we have new insights and we have new targets that may allow us to intervene early in the disease so we may um, uh, prevent lupus or at least uh, diagnose it very early when the uh, symptoms are very mild. Uh, am I optimistic that this is a likely uh, scenario to, to occur? After spending uh, several years of my life with lupus and seeing the progress in the last decade, I think this is feasible and I think within the next five or ten years we'll have better targets to prevent lupus or uh, treat it early. 
So hi, my name is Johanna Sandling. I'm a project coordinator and researcher at Uppsala University, and I work on genetics of the SOE. And genetics is the study of our genes that we inherit from our parents. And variations in our genes can sometimes uh, cause disease. And I work on identifying genetic factors for equity. And um, what's been found in the field of, field of SLE genetics so far is that there's a large number of genes uh, that contribute to the risk of SLE, but very few genes that alone can cause the disease. So we know that uh, the combination of our genes and the environment that we're exposed to probably leads to the disease in SLE. And we are uh, continuing to work uh, on genetics of SOP to identify the genetic risk factors to be able to predict risk of SOP in individuals and also risk of manifestations of SOP. And the genes that we have uh, identified so far are able to tell us a bit about the mechanisms of the disease. And this can really help in the development of uh, new drugs for SLE, and we hope that in the future that we'll also be able to predict risk for individuals. Thank you. My name is Marta Largona, and I work at the Center for Genomics and Oncological Research in Granada, Spain. I've been working with the genetics of lupus since uh, many, many years, and now I've been focusing on trying to dissect the heterogeneity of the disease because not all patients actually have an evolution or progress of the disease that is similar. So for this, we have been using what we call molecular patterns or molecular signatures. And that is something that has allowed us to find different groups of lupus patients that would actually, would have different molecular targets and different responses to uh, different drugs. So in this, I have a group of bioinformaticians and scientists that have been working on this. And I'm really hoping to be able to apply quite a lot of the, uh, the research that we, has been, we have been doing, uh, which I think it's going to be really very good for the research. So they don't go on, you know, trying so many treatments, so many drugs, making it difficult, making the disease even more uh, damaging but instead, from the very beginning, try to get the right type of treatment that they should have. So remember, lupus is not really, for me, lupus is really not one disease. There are also those patients that maybe don't get a diagnosis of lupus. We have to remember those. Those are individuals that have something, that have pain in their hands or in their body, that are feeling bad, and that also may have a molecular signature. So I believe that it's important to consider these individuals, try to find this molecular signature and see in which way we can actually treat them uh, better, maybe with the drugs that already are there. Maybe we can even find new drug targets because those molecular signatures can show you, can show us some new possible drug targets. So we might be developing this in the future. We are actually working now on a European project where we are looking into those mechanisms of response and non-response to the therapies. And I believe some biomarkers will come up and we will look with you know about this, of course, uh, rather quick. I hope so. <laughs> so research is ongoing. Uh, Lucas Europe is part of this, uh, of this project. And I am very happy actually to, to, to say that our results of now have been very promising and really very interesting. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Ronald van Bollenhoven. I'm a professor of rheumatology at the Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands. And I'm here at the European Lupus Congress. And I've just had the chance to speak about a topic that I think is very interesting, which is the question if lupus really is just one disease or could it be several diseases? Now, as uh, many of you know, the manifestations of lupus are very, very diverse. Patients can have uh, all kinds of different symptoms and no two patients are alike. They're all very different. Also, the blood tests are not so similar. There are some similarities, uh, antibody tests that are often used, but there's also differences. 
So you could say, well, maybe lupus is not really one disease, maybe it's several diseases. And that's always been a question, but it was never easy, never possible really to divide lupus into groups that made a real lot of sense that would be you know, consistent. But now I think what we're seeing in recent years is that there are more and more studies that show that if you use molecular or cellular analyses, and they have to be somewhat sophisticated analyses, that it actually does seem that the total amount, the total number of patients with lupus, that it is actually several groups of individuals who have the same underlying, uh, the same underlying pathophysiology. That's the word we use for the process, for what's happening underneath. And that seems to be different for different groups. And that is very exciting because it could be that those are really representing a distinct entity and that then the treatments would also be more effective if we use them for the right group. This is all fairly new. And actually today there was a real discussion about it and people are still divided in their minds about how it is. So I think it's an exciting time to be in because we're seeing these results and we're trying to understand how we can use this to get a deeper insight, but in the end also better treatments and better life for the patients. Hello, I'm Sylvia Kampijs. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist from um, Rotterdam, the Netherlands, the Erasmus University of Medical I was invited to the conference here in Stockholm uh, to highlight the pediatric side of, of our disease, of lupus. I think that's really important because uh, lupus in children is the same disease, but actually quite different. And specifically adults with childhood onset lupus are quite different uh, from uh, adults that only got the disease at adult age. And that has to do with the experience with medication and the long history with having recurrent flares, also the history of maybe have developed damage or getting damaged earlier than adults with lupus. So, um, no, I got, a, I got nice comments after my talk. And I also got from other specialists that I really appreciated that indeed childhood lupus should be more on the agenda of lupus Europe. So I'm really happy. So what should we do for children with lupus to improve their treatments? And I think one of the most important points is besides adding in Plaquenil, of course, and uh, adding in other treatments than prednisone, and actually the latter is most important. I think prednisone right now, everyone in the lupus world knows that this is a great treatment, but not for the long term. Even low doses are not uh, to be used anymore. There's actually no safe dose of prednisone. So I think that's the most important task. Uh, use prednisone, but use it shortly, and add other treatments if you uh, cannot get rid of the prednisone. Hi, I'm Susanne Petersen. I'm a registered nurse working at the Karolinska University Hospital, where I'm also a researcher. Uh, and today I have the had the possibility to present some of the, our work with patient-reported outcome measured uh, called Slack Systemic Lupus Activity Questionnaire and the shorter version, the Quick, quick Slack uh, Systemic Lupus Activity Questionnaire that we now have implemented in Sweden in our Rheumatology Equality Register. So the patient can have their own um, assessment before the consultation and we can look at the result in real time when meeting the, the doctor or a telephone call with the nurse. Now we're taking the next step with QSLAC. At the moment, the physicians is trying to learn how to use uh, the results in the clinical practice. But in the future, we also need to have, make access to the results for the patients and have the results have to be understandable for the patients. And I think these are very important areas for the future. And I'm very intrigued also to have to complement with written information according to the items in the questionnaire so it could help for self-management strategies and so on. Uh, Luis, uh, Luis Ines, uh, I don't remember the surname uh, of the, the, the guy, but I, I can, I can uh, tell you later, he, uh, he is a scientist and I understood he, he also has, he has his uh, uh, lupus clinic or rheumatology clinic. And he uh, mm, uh, presented one tool uh, which was uh, developed uh, uh, recently, 
and which uh, could be used by the doctors all over the world. And this tool not only uh, it takes into account like uh, blood measures, which doctors usually do, but also uh, they uh, do take in account uh, uh, some from patient uh, side, some um, uh, criteria. And it was the, 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 he was talking about how to improve uh, lupus activity measurements. So, so the, and this shows how active uh, lupus uh, is. So, um, uh, I think it's very, very, could be very useful uh, tool, but, uh, you know, the, the, it's probably the, the habits which, uh, which the doctors has to overcome. It was one question to, question to him from his colleague, how you are going to make uh, sure that doctors are using this? So he was explaining, explaining, and then he said, just upgrade yourself and start to use it. <laughs> So I'm Betty Diamond, and I work at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research in New York. Uh, would you please uh, tell patients about cognitive dysfunction in lupus? Well, cognitive dysfunction is very common in lupus, but it is not usually uh, assessed by clinicians and um, it's not usually discussed with patients. And uh, I think it's very important that we change the way we confront patients with lupus and we talk about uh, cognitive dysfunction because it both validates the patient's reality, because you know if you have cognitive problems and you know that they're not related to not getting enough sleep or uh, not taking a vacation or whatever it is, that they are part of your disease. Uh, and I think that, you know, it always empowers people to realize that they understand their disease and that they understand what's happening to them. And also until we recognize it as part of lupus and study it as part of lupus, we can't learn how we should intervene to reduce the symptoms or minimally stop the progression of symptoms. Also today I had a session with um, the visualized brain involvement in SME. It was really important to see, yes, the MRIs, uh, how the brain uh, reacts. Uh, I found out that we are five years older than another <laughs> in our brain. Uh, comparing the healthy uh, person, even though that uh, our MRIs do not have many differences from a healthy person. So, uh, hydroxychloroquine, thank you for coming to the session. Hydroxychloroquine is the bedrock of all treatments for all patients. We offer hydroxychloroquine to everyone. As I showed in my talk, this is an amazing medication. It is very safe. Uh, it has many, many actions. Uh, it reduces thrombosis. It reduces progression in vascular disease. It improves pregnancy outcomes. Uh, it reduces the risks of heart attacks. Um, and it is truly, truly disease modifying, uh, as shown by the, the big trials. Uh, and all these properties result in uh, reduced mortality uh, and generally better quality of life. So, anoxychloroquine should be in the water, I say. <laughs> so it's a very, very good drug. One gets concerned about retinopathy risks, so eye damage, but the data is fairly reassuring. Um, the risk of eye damage uh, with less than five years of use uh, and five milligrams a day or less is less than 1%. But, so the recommendations now is that after five years of use, and you should start seeing a consultant ophthalmologist for regular retinal checkup, OCT, and other modalities. But this is still one of the safest drugs that we use and the most effective, I'd say. So, turning around to corticosteroids, corticosteroids are uh, 
incredibly effective medications, but we need to learn to use them properly. So uh, long-term corticosteroids have many, many, many side effects. Um, and the move now very much is to use uh, intravenous steroids because they work very quickly. They work with a different mechanism of action to oral steroids, and they're less likely to cause the long-term damage. Um, the alternative then is to use steroids, but to taper the dose very, very quickly down to five milligrams a day or less, uh, and always in combination with hydroxychloroquine uh, and immunosuppressive therapies. And that way, um, either with intravenous steroids or steroids with a rapid taper, we can get control of the disease uh, and try and avoid the long-term side effects. Hi, my name is Anna Rahman, and I'm a professor of rheumatology at University College London. It's a huge privilege to be able to give a talk at the SLE Euro conference in Stockholm. And this is a session particularly for patients. And I've been asked to give a short summary of what I said for um, Lupus Europe. So my talk was about the old and the new DMARDs. So DMARDs stands for Disease Modifying Anti-Rheumatic Drugs. So these are not drugs which change your symptoms, they don't make you feel better straight away, they affect your immune system to reduce the activity of the disease. So they asked me to compare old ones and new ones. Old ones are things that many people will be familiar with, like mycophenolate, for example, azathioprine, hydroxychloroquine. New ones are what we call the biologic drugs. We call them biologics because they were developed by understanding the biology of lupus and because they're made in a particular way which uses biology. And the ones you may have heard of are rituximab, belimumab, and anifrolumab. Now, in my talk, I compared the experience of rheumatoid arthritis with the experience of lupus. Rheumatoid arthritis, there are a lot of these biologic drugs, a lot of them, a lot of choice, a lot of patients on them. It has revolutionized the treatment of that disease. Lupus, not so much. There are not so many biologics available and not as many patients on them. So why is this? There are lots of reasons for this. But in a nutshell, it has proved very difficult to show that biologics are effective in lupus. It's hard to do trials in lupus. It's a rare disease, a complicated disease. It's hard to prove what works and what doesn't work. There have been trials, and some of them have not met their endpoint. When well, not met their endpoint, it means they statistically were not able to prove that the new drug was better than the old drug. And I went over some of the reasons for that. But remember, the old drugs are still pretty good. And one of the reasons why the new drugs weren't shown to be better was that in those trials of patients on the old drugs, things like azathioprine and mycophenic, did pretty well. So if you're on those drugs, you're on good drugs. So what will be the place for these new biologic drugs in the future? It could be in people who just don't manage on the old drugs. We call these people refractory patients. Things aren't working that work in everybody else. There is a place for the new drugs in those patients, and they are being used in those patients now. More interestingly, some people have argued that use of the new drugs can reduce or even stop patients' reliance on prednisone or other corticosteroids. Many patients with lupus are on those drugs for a long time with side effects. If we could invent or discover some drug which reduced our reliance on corticosteroids, that would be brilliant. That day has not come yet, but maybe it will come in the future. There are trials designed to find that out. But till that happens, patients with lupus will still be taking corticosteroids and still benefiting from those corticosteroids. And finally, in the future, we're going to have to decide as a population, as a country, or different countries, what the place for these new drugs is because they're really, really expensive. There's nothing anybody can do about it. That's just how much they cost. That doesn't mean they should never be used, but they will be used only in certain patients fulfilling certain rules. So the future, there will be new drugs for lupus. They'll probably be used in a fairly limited way, and there will be rules about them, but there will be some new drugs, and the old drugs are still pretty good. In the pipeline, and especially targeting um, uh, the innate immune system, targeting the interferon signature, and also compounds that target uh, the adaptive immune system, for ex especially B cells, and uh, plasma cells. 
which are responsible for outer antibody production. I think the, um, the new treatments um, provide the hope that we can uh, improve the treatment of a systemic lupus in a more personalized uh, manner. There is also a hope for patients with uh, extremely severe refractory lupus with new therapies and these therapies uh, um, targeting B cells and or plasma cells. Um, as in these patients, autoreactive or autoantibodies are uh, stable despite treatment with uh, conventional drugs like uh, mycophenolate or azathioprine. And in these patients, um, it could has been shown that uh, new compounds or new treatment concepts can improve the situation in these patients and um, result in remission. Maybe in treatment-free remission. In, rem in a remission free of prednisolone uh, and other drugs which have, uh, which have the uh, potency of, of side effects. Hi, my name is Johanna Mucke and I'm from Düsseldorf in Germany. I did a survey um, on, among patients with lupus on tritotide, which I'd like to present. So I did a, um, this project last year in Amsterdam, and I'm working on treat to target mainly in Germany. So treat to target means picking a treatment target, which we should or we aim at with our therapeutic treatments, which usually is remission, so the lack of disease activity. And we do know that treat to target is a very sensible and, and reasonable approach in lupus and that it, that it does improve the outcome. But what we don't know is what our patients actually think of treat to target and this is why we conducted the survey among patients that was designed with a patient research partner. Um, we distributed it among four different countries via the patient organization, so among the Netherlands, Germany, um, Austria and Bulgaria. And that was exactly last year. It consisted of 13 questions. And in total, we had more than 800 respondents, which was a very high amount of patients. Um, and the first question that we asked was if the patients felt in remission, felt being in remission, so had no disease activity. And it was more than half um, the, of the patients that said yes, they were feeling, they, they were considering themselves being in remission. But there was still a substantial number of 35% of patients who said they were no, that they were not in remission. So a very fair amount. And also when we asked for the satisfaction with the disease and the current treatment, with the disease state and the current treatment, it was similar. So more than half said that they were actually satisfied with their, with their disease state and the current treatment. But again, among um, between 12 to 17 percent said that they were no, not at all to so somewhat satisfied. So I think this is the major point of my um, of my research or of the of the survey that while half of the patients are very satisfied the other half is not or a third is is not and this is something that we have to improve and another um, aspect was if the patients would be willing to participate in a treat to target trial and this is um, something that that's, that question was answered by, positively by among two thirds of the of the patients so treatment on um, research on treat to target was considered very important and two-thirds would, would participate in a trial. So this is something very positive because we are planning a trial in treat to target. And one last thing is major advantages or disadvantages of treat to target because that is also something very important. And while most aspects of treat to target were considered important, the only things that were seen a bit critical were the possibility of more doctor's visits and the possibility of a new immunosuppressive drugs that was seen a bit critical by some of the patients. But other than that, 
um, the, a, a, a reduction in steroid dose and um, a yeah, treatment control by treat to target was seen very positive. And I am very positive about that because I think treat to target is a great approach and we'd like to further study it and we need you, the patients, for that. Okay. Hello everybody, my name is Sharsad, I'm a PhD student at Karolinska Institute in Yannis Parodi's team and I would like to tell you about a survey that we sent out to people living with SLE at Karolinska University Hospital and Örebro University Hospital in Sweden. In the survey we were focused on find out how well the patients are taking their med medications just as prescribed by their physicians and this is also known as medication adherence. We found that different aspects of the well-being of the patients had a negative impact uh, on the adherence. For example, fatigue had a negative impact on both how well the, uh, the patients um, take their antimalarial medications as well as glucocorticoids. Also anxiety uh, and depression had an overall negative impact uh, on anti-rheumatic medication adherence. Overall certain beliefs uh, about how necessary medication and in general uh, about how necessary medications are and in general having positive views about medications had a good impact on medication adherence. On the other hand, being concerned about your medications and believing that medications are harmful uh, and overused uh, had a negative impact on medication adherence. We think that it is possible to through more informative patient physician visits address patients well-being and beliefs about medications and in that way hopefully improve their medication adherence and how well the patients are taking their uh, medications. Thank you. Hello, so I'm, I'm Kika Müllus from Lupus Europe and I today I just uh, talked about uh, adherence to medication and um, I used the Lupus Europe patient panel on treatment as my source. And uh, I was telling doctors and scientists uh, why lupus people, uh, about the adherence to medication, different ideas, why, why patients may stop taking a medication and what keeps them on taking the medication. That's it. I think uh, that uh, the best thing for a patient uh, in terms of comorbidities is the prevention. So uh, patients have not to uh, be worried to uh, think that they have more risk than the others and so they have more uh, uh, duty uh, to prevent uh, all the problems. So, for cardiovascular risk is as important as taking statin is not smoke is to to do a, a health life to do movement to to do a safe style of life and then to follow what the doctor say so not to, to make discount on the treatment because it's important uh, to follow the preventive measure and to keep the lupus in uh, remission. And for the infection, I would suggest everybody to vaccinate, 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 because we have the instrument to, be, to have a, a good defense from the infection and we have to use, just to use them. Hello, my name is Zaira Moura. I'm head of the internal medicine department in Paris, which is the French National Referral Center for Lupus. So I just gave a speech on uh, lupus, uh, COVID vaccination in lupus patients. 
The key messages of this speech is that uh, most of our patients are immunocompromised and all SLE patients should be advised to receive COVID vaccination because we need to protect them against severe forms of COVID. This is a key message and now we have bivalent uh, vaccines and this vaccination could be done simultaneously with the flu vaccination. Hi, my name is Fern and I'm from Iceland. In the European SLEM meeting, I participated in a Facebook discussion about patient-centered care. I thought this form of discussion to be very interesting and allow for more lively discussion and a greater participation by all who listened, more so than happened in other forms of educational lectures. There, the general audience was able to be active participant in the discussion with the academics. The content of the fishbowl was very interesting. I think that patient-centered care is the key to successful managing the patient and getting the disease under control. In the system that was described there, a team takes care of the patient and one coordinator collects all information from the team and coordinates the work. I think this system ensures the safety of the patients and makes their life easier than when the patient has to seek service from different specialists who do not communicate or coordinate. Thank you very much. At first, I, I think this is uh, very uh, interesting to be with, uh, be on. Uh, it's a very interesting Congress, uh, and uh, there's a lot to, that has interest uh, in me as a patient. So um, I'm very glad to be here. I also have uh, been um, at, uh, I think, uh, the one a session about uh, a questionnaire. Uh, Slack or something like that. So it was, it, uh, I don't know when, but that's a questionnaire that you uh, that I used to uh, measure uh, the patients uh, how they are doing, um, and uh, they it's uh, it was used to. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read <laughs> the questionnaire is some doc, uh, doctors and Karolinska uses measures the state uh, the patients are in uh, and I will take that with me and um, find out how we can use it in Norway or if it's been used because uh, I think that's very interesting because when we are uh, at the, the doctor's place or in at the specialists uh, we often might forget what to ask uh, the uh, physician uh, and then again uh, if we can uh, answer a questionnaire uh, you can uh, you have a pre uh, we can go to the uh, consult consultations uh, and they are prepared and i am prepared uh, it was originally made for um, studies but the patients that are using it they uh, find it really uh, interesting and uh, that it, the questions are related to um, me as a patient so um, yeah I thought that was very interesting uh, I can take that with me to my my board in uh, Norway, and maybe we can uh, maybe we can go to the doctors and get them to use it. Uh, the um, exciting and um, overwhelming thing about all of this has been the fact that we are collaborating and and having contacts with the with the doctors and and researchers and and um we are we are being taken into consideration and and we, we are being heard for example i got to be um i got to participate in a baseball discussion just now about 
um, whether a patient should be involved in uh, lupus research. And I, I got to have many interesting conversations since uh, I happened to be, be the only patient representative there. Well, Alan was there for a while, but but it was interesting, and and I I think the realization between uh, between the doctors is to um, connect and and have um, have the patients involved, whether it's in research or or just. Uh, for example, the regular um, visits to the doctor. So it's not something um, done from above us. But it, it's like uh, the realization that that the adherence and, and other benefits come from from connecting and and hearing one another out and 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 to have this connection. And not not just not just um, monologue. I'm so overwhelmed and privileged to be able to be involved in, with all this and and learning things. And I surely have many things to discuss with my doctor after this. Wonderful. And, and also, yeah, giving out info to to the ones uh, who are not here in in our our crew and and all those who are interested. Yes, and that's exactly what we're doing now. <laughs> Giving back information to the people who weren't able to be there. And we have we are lucky enough to have some of the PAN members here tonight who also took part. So uh, first of all, I'll leave the floor to Delilah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Well, uh, I would say that it was a fascinating meeting uh, where many different aspects of lupus were discussed by experts and lupus patients were able to be involved too, which is fantastic. Um, a great opportunity for self-empowerment. So there were many sessions, but I'll mention three of them, uh, three takeaways for, for me. Um, first, I was able to participate in the lupus nephritis uh, fishbowl with Professor Parodis, where we discussed what disease modification really means in lupus nephritis, which clearly can become very difficult to treat. Um, also had the opportunity to participate in the session about old and new drugs uh, with Professor Vasconcelos. We discussed the importance of old drugs, what treatments are coming soon, and what adherence means. So our colleague Kika did a fantastic job too. And finally, the meeting ended for me with a message of hope from Professor Vital and the role of interference in lupus, how the path of severe cases can be changed and how we can change the future of lupus. So that was really, really interesting and fantastic to hear. And uh, I look forward to 2024 and what a new lupus uh, perspective we will have in, in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much, Delilah. It was a pleasure to have you there. And I know you also managed to network with a lot of new doctors and uh, get a lot of information out to them. So thank you so much. Thank you. So, Ida, you're up. Okay, Please also show your video. <laughs> I cannot uh, uh, change it, uh, my video, I mean, because okay. you have, Alan has to do it, I think. No. No? I think you should be able to. Okay, yes, now, now it's, it should, yes. should be, yes. okay. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, my takeaway, probably the, the, uh, the most important uh, takeaway was from the fishbowl uh, discussion with, differ, uh, with uh, uh, different uh, doctors. Uh, how should anxiety and depression be targeted in uh, lupus? So it was really popular discussion also uh, um, uh, between uh, lupus patients. Uh, a lot of us were there, and some of the, some of us dared to uh, join the, uh, the this round table and uh, to take part. So my takeaways uh, from uh, this uh, uh, session 
First of all, is yes, uh, uh, almost everyone has some uh, uh, mental or uh, uh, psychological uh, issues, uh, especially when you are uh, newly diagnosed. Uh, and uh, it's important that in uh, different countries uh, have different uh, level of help. Some countries have lupus teams, uh, which has already some psych psychologists uh, or, and the patient can have already the uh, uh, psychotherapy. There are some small countries uh, where we don't have such, such a uh, such lupus teams or lupus clinics, uh, even the doctors have uh, from 10 to 15 or, or minutes for one patient. That's it, what you have. So uh, uh, what I want to uh, tell, what was important also from doctor's side, uh, that is each patient also has to take responsibility for his knowledge, uh, to uh, look for the information, uh, to tell also doctor that uh, I'm not, not well. Uh, I need uh, maybe to see the uh, psychologist. So uh, first of all, patient also has to take responsibility uh, because of the system uh, uh, we have, especially in smaller countries. Um, Yes, I think uh, ah, it's, it's also important, I think, to uh, it was to see that uh, uh, most of the doctors, they do agree that this, this has to be addressed, uh, this issue, the uh, mental, the psychological uh, uh, state of lupus patients. So the doctors, I think they also agreed that it has to be taken in account. So this is my takeaway. Yes, the main thank, one. Thank you so much, Ida. And I can tell that from that session, actually, Eric Morand, Professor Eric Morand from Australia, who's a very renowned professor, he actually wrote on Twitter afterwards. He learned from our patients that day to take two minutes out of each consultation and ask how the patient is doing. So great work. You taught to the professor something very important. <laughs> thank <fun>. you so much. <laughs> um, Blanca. Do you want to go next? On this one, did you manage to resolve your issue? Yes, I finished my... Yes. <laughs> Sorry about the technical difficulties. It's fine. Uh, I thought this was amazing to be in the Congress and it was so amazing to be like, to be able to talk to all the specialists and take the videos and have private talks and hear all these sessions about different things and it was kind of mind-blowing. But apart from the fishbowl that I thought was very interesting, I, I my main takeaway is that I thought this session about all the new drugs was very interesting and it's exciting to hear about all the new drugs that will possibly be in the market in a few years. And also how they are still, they are still doing research on on, for example, how valuable hydrochloroquine is, and it is, and how important it is to hold them down the symptom of lupus, and how much emphasis is on sunscreen as part of treatment. And, and because of that, it was interesting to me to hear that the, how many new research show that many patients are not taking the medicine on, and not using sunscreen even though they are telling the doctors that they are, and therefore the treatment don't work. So... Yeah, so, the, yeah. the treatment doesn't work unless you take it. <laughs> yeah, so, and I thought it was very interesting that people are saying that they take their drugs. And we also, I also had a very interesting talk to Lawrence Arnott uh, about, about genes and and how lupus differently affects men, men and females, and and the controversy if maybe the difference is not as much as it is thought to be, and maybe it is. Maybe men are underdiagnosed. I thought that was very interesting. And, yes, and I could talk all night. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> There's so many interesting things. 
Thank you so much, Juan. And I also think, especially the one about men having lupuses, which is not really spoken about enough because there are men with lupus and we need to recognize them as well. Yeah. So, Blanca, now you're up. Well, <clears throat> Uh, first time, one, I am Blanca from Spain. I'm member of the PAN member of the Lupus Europe. And uh, what for me has been fantastic to attend a Congress in a presential way, because well, after two years of virtual conferences, I think we need to meet each other and talk face to face about what, what, what has happened and what will be happen in the next years. Well, for me, it has been um, terrible the, to know about the interest that the new people is having in, in lupus, new health professionals, new researchers, um, uh, new students that want to present their abstract, their lecture. Well, they, want, they all want to know about lupus and want to, to speak with the very big professionals that we have in lupus for many years and to how to cooperate with patients and with doctors. Uh, for me, I attend some lectures and it was very important to know more about the advance in genetics and epigenetics, because I think is where um, the new treatments are based. And then in the three to target treatments and in order to get the personalized medicine every patient with the correct medicine in order to avoid comorbidities and to avoid side effects. For me, it's the most important because as we have seen in the Congress, um, quality of life is a question that is very important, not only the well-being of the patient, but the quality of life, the, the problems, psychological problems, the, with the fishbowl that we participate, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, and other problems not related to the lupus, but to the treatments. And in this way is where the, the doctors are um, um, saying that it's necessary to give the treatment, but in the correct dose and the correct time, not forever and to control every patient. And more about, um, yes, what we have seen is that the coordination between patients and doctors is primordial, is very important. And for that, all the participation that we can have in all these congresses, in talks with doctors, is, is being very important in order to get the best results. And well, I want to congratulate Lubus Europe because this opportunity has been perfect for talking, for uh, to be trained, and to be more effective and be more useful, more, more helpful to all this uh, labor that we are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for joining, Blanca. It was really great having you there. And I can tell you that all the doctors feel like they learned a lot from lupus patients. So you did a great job representing us. Yes, Lena, how did you know it's your turn? <laughs> so just keep your camera on. <laughs> And Good mute. yeah. Okay, so hello. Hi. Uh, I'm really moved, uh, Jeanette, because I heard you talking about the Australian doctor. And uh, it was uh, the fishbowl I took part. And um, actually, I'm really moved right now because it was the promise he gave me when we were leaving. Uh, the session, the fishbowl, that I, I promised to you that uh, when uh, I see the next patient, I will give him the two minutes. And um, yeah, yes, that's really big. Uh, it, it was now that I feel it that that really happened, and it's really important for me, and I think for all of us, because actually it's, uh, it's what we do, it's what we want to 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 achieve. Uh, being part in this organization. Uh, anyway, uh, from the, this peace ball, uh, this was uh, what I was about to talk about, that uh, it showed up the necessity of talking between doctors and patients, and how much truly the doctors uh, listen to the patient's feelings and what they truly have to say. 
So yes, two bullets matters, and if they uh, uh, hear the person for two minutes, they can uh, they can find uh, many things about their daily thing, about their life, and how can they do anything they want cooperating with the patient. Uh, also, uh, in assessing consider the Jensen environment in SLE, um, it was clear to me that psychology factors can fire up the disease, uh, but not create it. Uh, it was a clear separation uh, in my head now. And uh, it's really nice to know that, yes, controlling your feelings sometimes can make you feel better in your daily routines, but uh, if you don't uh, uh, follow the, the doctor uh, uh, treatment and uh, everything you have to do as a patient, well, things will be hard. So uh, I will take my emotion in <laughs> my water and go away now. Thank you very much. And please, if you are not a part of uh, Europe Lupus, uh, please uh, come to us, come and work with us. Because uh, we can do many things together. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Thank you so much, Lena. Thank you for being there. So I think the last one who wants to say a few words is uh, Mechi. If she is here. No. Mechi, are you there? Oh, I can see Kika wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah go ahead unmute yourself and speak thank you uh, I thought I, I I would be without okay I didn't re register to say something but first of all thank you so much uh, for for the for, for giving us the chance to, to to be involved in this congress it was so marvelous we've heard I've heard so, I, I I could repeat everything that the people before me have. Uh, well, I, I gave a speech on medical or medication adherence, and uh, then I was I participated as a patient uh, in a fishbowl of patient-centered uh, healthcare uh, by lupus team. And uh, the main question is who's who's the lupus team leader? So uh, as uh, who said it, it was Ida who said that in all the countries there aren't lupus teams, and that's true. That's very true. Uh, in Finland, we don't. And uh, but what was uh, important in that particular fishbowl was what Marta Mosca said that it doesn't matter who the leader is. It could be, for instance, your GP, uh, because sometimes it's not good to have it. Uh, ha have a rheumatologist to do uh, to be the team leader in some cases uh, because um, there are so many things that we are being treated uh, of and uh, but okay my main takeaway <laughs> was Dr Diamond and the and the cognitive dysfunction in lupus that her speech you saw it on the video you will find it on the uh, lupus Europe YouTube channel. Uh, that is a marvelous speech. I think that is an important, important piece of information. She was saying that most of us, or very many of us, uh, have it. Uh, but but uh, currently, the the rheumatologists aren't, aren't assessing it at all, and that how it should be assessed uh, to to be uh, treated, and uh, it should be acknowledged. The uh, cognitive uh, symptoms we have so I think that that was my main takeaway thank you yeah. thank you Kika yes that was a great presentation by Betty Diamond it was really good to hear that's the reason why we are feeling like there's a bit wrong in the in the brain when we have lupus because there is a bit wrong <laughs> so Betty you're back <laughs> and what I learned in Stockholm is that when I, uh, I'm a young member from PAN, and then I thought, what can I do? And I saw there, there's so much to do. And I think uh, we not always make the good questions to the doctor. And then it's of if we speak different languages. 
Yeah, makes exactly. that sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't speak on the same level, patients and doctors. Yes, yes. Mm. So you felt and like we, you, were, you I, had a role. Yes, and sometimes we are uh, too fast uh, satisfied. Mm -hmm. we t the doctor says, take that, and we do it. Yeah. We don't think anymore. Mm -hmm. So we need to question the doctors and ask, yeah. why do I need to take it? And what a good is... list, good, good list with good questions. Mm -hmm. Great. And do you feel like the doctors were listening to you while you were there? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes they have uh, the speech done before I'm in. Hmm. Yeah, before you're in the door at the consultation. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So how did you feel as a new PAN member? How did you feel about the experience of going to Stockholm? And uh, It was a great experience also to see everyone with the same disease and the same questions. Mm. Yeah. It was really great to have you there. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> or oh, stay here. But <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> okay. So now we go back to the slideshow. Because now it's time for you guys to ask questions if you have any. So you can either unmute yourself or ask a question and ask a question, or you can write it in the chat box if you want to want to. And we are also taking questions from Facebook Live if people sitting at home and on Facebook has something to say. Yes, Amy, please go ahead. Hi. Um, it was more of a comment, actually, because uh, it's interesting enough that Kika was talking about cognitive dysfunction um, in lupus. And I've actually just been asked by my hospital in Manchester to be part of a study, which I... Uh, did um, a couple of days ago about, it's actually called stratifying cognitive dysfunction in systemic lupus and its associated factors. So it's quite positive to see that like those studies are going on and that it's all sort of correlating that, you know, the conversations that were happening at the ELM hopefully are the conversations that are happening in the national countries too and the studies that are happening there. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was really lovely to see the new PAM members and how much they, I mean, I'm part of the PAN WhatsApp group as well. And unfortunately I couldn't be present at the ELM, but it was so active. <laughs> Everybody was so excited and it was like palpable in the actual text conversation, which was fantastic. And I'm so impressed with how you all just jumped in head first. You know, it's it can be intimidating at the start uh, as a new PAN member, but everybody went solo you know, jumped right in, was chatting to doctors. It was very impressive. Exactly. Yeah. And the feedback that you've just given was fantastic. Like, it was really gutted not to be there, but I kind of <laughs> got a mini version of it just now, which was nice. We'll be there next time. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Definitely. <laughs> Can't keep me away. <laughs> yeah, but let's, let's hope, indeed, that the information from the ELM now goes through the doctors to back to the, the individual countries and to the departments that, where they, they need to hear the information. And to have a yeah. focus on things like mental uh, health as well. Actually, I do, um, if possible, one question would be, there. Uh, they actually asked me to be in another study about lipids in lupus. Was there any conversation about that at the ELM at all? About, not you know, any, like... Uh, we, we heard a bit about uh, heart disease, but not a lot about lipids in itself. Okay. I know it's quite um, a niche yeah. area. But it might have been, I wasn't, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take part in all the sessions. In that time, oh, how <laughs> because we had three different rooms with sessions at going on at once. So, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, but really great to hear that you could feel the energy. And oh, I hope yeah. people at home could feel it on social media as well. And the confidence, yeah. it's very impressive, the confidence of um, everybody in interacting with doctors, which can be intimidating. Um but it, obviously the ELM must have given that nice environment where you felt like you could interact on a level, in the same level. 
definitely helped that we had patients involved in creating the program and also that we actually had a de dedicated program for patients as well. Uh, of course, they could take part in the, all the other parts as well, but we have had sessions that were dedicated to patients, which made it a lot easier to follow the discussions. Mm -hmm. And it was very much the feeling that patients were welcome to join into the discussions and appreciate it. That's, br that's brilliant. So we were very sad that you weren't there. Oh, it's not all about me. I'm just being naughty. It's we, about you we, guys. <laughs> we were also very sad that Ines wasn't there. I so know, yeah. Also next time. Um, so we have a question from Wendy, but I'm going to uh, wait a bit with that. And I have a reason for that. Uh, are there any other questions in the meantime? Or comments? You can have give a comment if you want to. Same as Amy. Or any of the PAN members who haven't presented yet, you can also tell us what you thought about it. All clear. We have very good PAN members. <laughs> so, if, yes. If I can jump in, we've got um, two comments from Facebook. Um, somebody of the Association of Lupus from Argentina saying, thank you very much for sharing such an important update. Um, and then uh, other people watching asking for the entire video um, so they can watch it afterwards. Really. Yes. They really yeah. enjoyed it. And that uh, actually brings me to, if you could click once, Alain, you can actually watch all the videos that you've just seen and more videos on our YouTube channel. So if you go to Lupus Europe, YouTube and you put in Lupus Europe, we have our own channel and there you can follow all the different, uh, see all the different videos that were made and more videos will be uploaded as we go along because we need to put subtitles on them as well as you saw Zoe was very busy putting subtitles on them all um, so have a have a look and see where there are many great videos there and now I want to go back to you Wendy because you're writing, writing I heard from industry in the Netherlands AstraZeneca I think it was uh, that 100 questions was the most important message from SO Euro. Wow, that's great to hear, Wendy, because we're going to talk about it now, actually. Um, I'm so glad that other people got that information. I was so lucky that I was invited to tell about this project actually in the closing session of the entire Congress. So we had the stage and the attention of all the lupologists in the room. So um, you all know that it can be difficult to get good quality information on lupus on the internet. The moment you get the diagnosis of lupus, even though your doctor tells you not to go online and look up lupus, the first thing you do when you get home is go online and Google lupus. And the, the information you can find there is often outdated. It's often not valid. And you can find a lot of false information. So what we wanted to do was create a website where you can find good quality information. And at the occasion of the European Lupus meeting, actually Lupus Europe launched a new website to help give that good quality information. It's called lupus100.org. Next slide, please. Now the website is based on the French booklet, Lupus in 100 Questions, initiated by the French Filière. The questions have been translated and adapted where relevant, jointly by patients and doctors. New questions have been added based on patient input from our patient advisory network. And the final English version has received comments from the ERN Reconnect uh, SLE network and is now available at lupus100.org. Our goal is to make it available in 18 European languages so that every person living with lupus has access to it in a language they can understand. Next, please. So it answers key questions raised by patients. Questions like the, like the ones you could see on the slide. Yep. Thank you, Alan. You're quick. <laughs> the 100 questions are grouped into four chapters. Lupus challenges, lupus manifestations, lupus management, and living with lupus. Next, please. When clicking on a question, you get the answer straight away like should i quit smoking the answer is yes and then there's more information underneath to give you more details about why you should quit smoking it's been 
Yes, we can move on. I think we have, we've lost uh, where we are now. <laughs> it's been verified by doctors and patients with key takeaways and suggested other questions that you might be interested in. Now we can move. The site also allows to get in contact with a patient group speaking your language to find a reference center or to suggest a question to be added on the site. The initial feedback from doctors and patients is hugely positive. It really fulfills a need, and we hope that by having it available in 18 languages, it will become the top of the Google search list so that people with lupus questions immediately get a validated answer to their question. Next, please. Now, we need one doctor and one patient to work together in a team, validating the translation into each of the 18 languages. So we don't need to actually do the translation. It's already been done. What we need is for you to validate the translation already done so we make sure that all the technical things are all right and that it's understandable by patients. We already have some people who have volunteered. In some cases, we already have doctors, but still need patients. If you want to help with that, please contact us on secretariat at lupusurope.org. And please also help us disseminate it and spread the information in your network and that we want to have it translated into your national language. And you can share the, the website, so lupus100.org, all around in your network. That would really be appreciated a lot. Now, this brings us to the last slide where I thank you for your attention. And I hope to see you all soon. And I hope you make good use of the Lupus 100 uh, questions. And also that you have an, ability, an opportunity to see some of the other videos made because we had some really great feedback from all of our PAM members. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you for the great presentation. Thank you, thank Blanca, you. for giving feedback. Yes. Yes. And I would, no. like, I would like to say something that is from the people that is asking from Argentina uh, yeah. to inform that uh, despite of it was a European Congress, we have had representatives from everywhere in the, in the world. And people from Gladel, Dr. Pons was there uh, representing all the, the work they are doing in uh, Latin America. Mm, yeah. And we are, we are in contact with them so that um, they are doing a very good job and want to be here with us in this European Congress. Oh, well, that's really great. And it's really great to know that we connected all around the world, even though it was a, a European Congress, all people from all around the world were taking part. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.